Hi, everyone. So uh, I realized that this, uh, this talk title was too long when I tried to put all of it on this, uh, on this slide, and it just kind of, my name kind of just went out of, uh, went out of focus, so, which is why I have it in, anyway, which is why I changed it. But today I'm going to talk to you about functional DevOps in a dysfunctional world, and um, I'm going to try to explain what that means. Um, so at the, at the end, I hope you agree that it's uh, at least appropriately titled, if not ideally. So a little bit about me, and I promise this is relevant. Um, so as uh, as Fraser mentioned, uh, so I'm a I'm a lapsed web developer. I did did um, I, you know I wrote I wrote code that was meant to be run in a browser for uh, for a while, and I kind of I got I got pretty sick of it. Uh, the reasons I got sick of it were more to do with things like uh, the lack of testing or just the you know the just the breakage everywhere. But I decided functional programming was a solution to all my problems, and so far. It seems like I was on the right track. I haven't really found any issues that the appropriate application of function programming, the giant hammer, has, uh, has failed to fix. So now, I, uh, not only, so now I'm not a web developer anymore, like not currently, which is great. But um, I'm a, I'm, in fact, I'm a DevOps engineer. So I'm a DevOps engineer at this company in Singapore called Zalora. Um, and we are enthusiastically hiring. So if there's anything that here that you see that you really, really like, feel free to come talk to me after. This is also the first job that I've had that uh, requires me to, like, that has given me business cards. So if you'd like a business card, please come see me. They're very nice. Uh, I, I quite like them. So, OK, so I'm a DevOps engineer. And um, so what's the DevOps pitch? So I, um, I'm assuming that people here at least care about DevOps or are interested. But if for, for whatever reason you're not convinced that it's, it's a thing, like why do I care about DevOps? What is the point of DevOps? So for me, the, the fundamental uh, issue, I mean, the fundamental issue that DevOps tries to solve is this. So I'm tired of hearing this, and I'm tired of saying it. And as a developer, like when I said to someone, hey, it works in my machine, it wasn't good enough, right? It's not, it's not like, hey, it works in my machine, great. Like that means it's automatically perfectly configured and ready to run in production, or that it's already in production. And the challenge of software development, I find, now, especially in this role, doesn't end when you write your last line of code, right? As a, as a developer, you write your last line of code, and then what? Right, it doesn't magically deliver value to your users. It doesn't magically put itself on their machines or in their browser or whatever. So somebody actually has to do that work. And if you're, at the, if, if you're like fully committed to the DevOps philosophy, then everyone does that work together. But unfortunately, I'm at that stage of DevOps where you have DevOps engineers, which means that there are people who write the code, and there are people who deploy the stuff, and they're not exactly the same. So, in a sense, I'm kind of a glorified sysadmin. But if I'm a glorified sysadmin, then I need to do the best job that I can in um, making sure that it's as easy as possible for me to deploy code, maintain code, change it, even if I'm not writing the code myself. So that's a DevOps pitch. So here are some things that I want for my DevOps setup. And uh, I'm going to try to tell you about them as contrasted to something that I used to do in my previous job, in my past life as a web dev. So my past life as a web dev, what I used to do when I had to deploy my code to production was that I actually SSH'd onto a production server. I did a git pull, and then I uh, manually ran database migrations. And in fact, this, was, uh, this is not exactly what I did. What I did is I did this on a staging server, and then I very meticulously wrote down, if I was doing it correctly, the instructions that I needed to do in order to perform this on the prod server. And then I would do this, or someone else would do this. And the problem with this, you know, there's a lot of problems with this. And I kind of knew at that stage even that this is not ideal, but I couldn't quite articulate why. So here are some things that I want from a dev good DevOps process. It has to be automatic. Like, for one thing, manually like going in, SSHing in, and typing a bunch of commands in, oh, there's a typo, oops, I've just done something really horribly, and everything's gone wrong, is not good enough. I need to be able to have like, one command that I run that works. It has to be automatic. It has to be like a push button type thing. It has to be repeatable. So, Doing things on staging, when I did them on staging, wouldn't exactly translate to the way I did things on production, because staging and production are different. They're not exactly the same machine. I have to be able to do something to one machine and then reliably and repeatably do it to a whole bunch of different machines. So this isn't exactly like something that I need, but this is something that I want in a DevOps process. I want to be able to say, hey, the machine is in a desired state, so I, don't want, to be able to do, I, I want to be able to do something again and have the system tell me, hey, I don't actually need to do anything. The system's already in the state that you want it to be. Uh, this is really good because if I have to rebuild and redo everything, doing DevOps things is usually quite slow. And that's something that I, you know, sometimes I quite like it because it means that no one's kind of like pushing me to like deliver things right now. But when I want to actually um, do something, it's good that the system knows that the state that it's in is ideal and it doesn't really need to change anything at the moment. So this is something that is really, really handy, like almost impossible, right? How do you reverse a, uh, how do you reverse, uh, a deployment? And it's hard, but it's not impossible. And 
I'm going to, I'm going to try at least trying to demonstrate how, it, how it's not. But it would be nice to be able to go, hey, this turns out I made a mistake. How do I roll back? And people need to roll back all the time. But having a system that helps you to do it is really, really good. And this is an interesting one. So when I was doing my Git pulls, when I did a Git pull, and then so it turns out Git pulls aren't actually atomic. So when you're copying files over, uh, which is what Git pull is doing, it's possible to kind of visit the site at that point in time and see a glitch or just have a, have a broken site. And the reason for that is that the system, like the users that can observe a state between my old state and my new state. What I would really like, and when I was looking into this, is um, for the system to like not be able to tell the difference. So either you're in the old state and everything's working the way it was in the old state, or you're in the new state and everything's working the way it is in the new state. So uh, atomic deployments are really, really good. And um, when I was looking into a way of kind of, you know, basically building a better mousetrap, trying to look at my, um, uh, seeing what I could, we could have done about our DevOps process. Somebody suggested, hey, what you really want to do is you want to have like some location over here that you git pull to, and you want to symlink over. And why symlinks? So the reason that symlinks are cool is because they're, they're one of the few things in Unix that is atomic. Um, uh, like a symlink is atomic. So you, can, you will never be able to observe, a uh, Unix system cannot observe anything between uh, one target of a symlink and the other target of a symlink. And that's important. So I'm, I'm mentioning this now because uh, we're going to come back to this later. So anyway, they're atomic. So these are DevOps desiderata. I think these are things that are important for a, DevOps, a good DevOps process to have. So let's begin. And uh, I'm hoping to live demo this as I do it, just so you can see that this is actually something that's happening. So the examples are toy examples, but the, uh, the technology is very real. And this is, this is my job. This is what I do every day. Um, so here's a small Haskell app. So the similarity to the Scotty example in the, on the Hackage page is entirely coincidental. But let's pretend that this is an app that I want to deploy. So it's quite straightforward. It um, outputs the words blank me up, uh, which is why I've called it that. So this is an app. Uh, this, is the, this is the Haskell file. This is the Cabal file that I need. Now we start doing the next thing. So Nix is a package manager. It's a programming language, and it's a, it's a package ecosystem as well. It's a lot of things. But um, there's a tool called Cabal to Nix here that I can use to generate a build description of what I need to build for this app. And when I run this, it's going to um, create, the, create the app and allow it to run. So demo. I think this is probably a good time. So I'm going to go to my Nix folder. So, wow. Type a lot slow and you're really, really nervous. Okay. So, oh no, I made a mistake. What does that file look like? It's not important. I'm not going to get into it. You can ask me later, and maybe um, I will show you. OK, so I do that. And then I can do uh, OK, so I've run it. It's running. It works. As you can see, at no point at this stage did I interact with the Haskell tooling at all. I just ran it in Nix. Everything works in Nix. And that's one of the value propositions of Nix, is that it abstracts over a lot of the package tooling. So not just Haskell, but also Python, Ruby, um, Rust, uh, what else? Perl, PHP, Node. Um, so anyway, so that's, uh, that's an example of that working. So this is, this, is, uh, this is cool, right? But I think it's also what, what's really cool is uh, what happens when something goes wrong. So I have a working app right now, right? So what, what if I edit my main.haskell file. And what if I put something in here that makes no sense? Right? I do that. It's broken. But then I want to build it again. So it tries to build, right? It'll try. But it'll fail. Of course it'll fail. That makes sense, right? It should fail. Like, but when I do the thing again, it's still running. So what's happened here, what Nix does is that in a sandbox, it builds the app. And if there's a fit, and um, when it succeeds, it creates a symlink, which is what this is. Uh, so my, my result is actually a symlink. Uh, 
Yes. So it creates a symlink. And when it successfully builds, it swaps over the symlink. So now that I've broken my app, it hasn't swapped over the symlink. It's just said, hey, the old thing is good. So this is, this is the first manifestation of what I mean by atomic. So Nix fails gracefully in this sense, in the sense that if there's something, something's gone wrong, it'll um, go back. By the way, is this, is this font OK for everyone? Is, is everyone able to read this? Yeah? OK, good. Um, anyway, so I'm going to unbreak my app and continue on. Oh, no. That's not what I meant. OK. So. So now that I've uh, configured an app using Nix, um, I'm going to go a bit further and configure a service. So an app, running an app is quite straightforward, but doing a long-running service is a bit more complex. So what Nix does is that it integrates with systemd. Um, and it allows you to define a service file using um, systemd. So define a service, uh, for, like a systemd unit file. So this is the first bit of Nix I'm going to show you today. This is a function. So these are arguments to the function. This is, um, these are like, this is like dependency injection, essentially. So this is the configuration, all the configuration. This is the Nix library of functions. These are the, uh, all the packages that are available. And uh, what I want to do is I want to create an attribute set. An attribute set is Nix lingo for a dictionary. A dictionary with two keys. One key is called options, the options that, the, uh, that my service will have, and config, so the configuration for the service. Um, so yeah, yeah. So that's my, uh, that's my yeah, so that's, this is what the this, this skeleton of that looks like. The first thing I want to do is I actually want to make my uh, package available. So the Nix build that I was running before can be expressed within Nix itself as uh, just a package. So this is the name of the file. Uh, I'm passing in my Nix packages for completeness, although if I left this out, I think it might probably work. Anyway. So yeah, options and config. So the first thing I want to do is define an option that, um, if enabled, will enable the app. So I don't want the app to always be running, right? I want it to be. I want to be able to say that, hey, I want this app running, or hey, no, actually, I don't want this app running. So I have one option. It's a it's a it's a function from the library. So this is a this is a library provided thing that will hey, if it, if it's option if it's enabled if it's set to true, then my service will be enabled. And my config, of course, I only want it to be configured if the service is actually enabled. Um, okay, this is the this is the I guess the hairy complex part, but it's not so bad. Uh, the first line is the so I actually want to open up the port that's uh, that I've configured in my app because Nix won't open that up for me unless I tell it to uh, Nix OS at least. And this is a systemd configuration file. Um, I'm going to ask you to trust me just just for now that it uh, that it works. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to like um, give you a bit more evidence later. But this looks pretty much like a systemd file, right? You have an exec start, you have a restart, you have a kill mode so on and so forth. This is ex essentially what it looks like in, um, in Nix. So, so far, what is functional? Uh, one thing I didn't mention is that, uh, that maybe I forgot to mention. Maybe I, can make it, maybe I can show you, actually. Maybe I can demo it again. So if I do my Nix build again, yes, it hasn't rebuilt anything. You have, you have, it hasn't gone and like, run the compiler or whatever. It's because Nix aggressively caches uh, builds, and it aggressively, like, it uses a definition of referential transparency, which is that if the inputs are exactly the same, the inputs to, the, to, um, to a build process are the same, the output, it'll give you the same output. So given the fact that it's cached my old build, and it's, um, the second build like, failed or whatever, so it hasn't actually had to rebuild anything. It can just give me back the same thing that it gave me the first time I asked it to build with the same parameters. So it's referentially transparent. Um, so far, everything here is just config, right? I am not actually like running any processes here. I'm just saying that hey, I want to, um, I want this this value to have this. Uh, sorry, I want this key to have this value. I want these keys to have these values. So it's declarative, uh, referentially transparent. Uh, I'd say that's that's a pretty good definition. And if you go to the Nix website, you know, if you go to nixos.org/nix, it says hey, we're the purely functional package manager. And I'm not sure if I go quite that far, but it is quite functional. It's pretty cool. OK, so um, next thing I want to do is I actually want to ship it, right? So first I create this file where I import that previous file. So I, so I put this in a new directory called ops, and I enable my service. Makes sense. So the value of doing this is that now I can go back and like, demonstrate that I can actually get that U, uh, systemd service file out. So if I go to this directory and run this command, which I'm going to do, just say. Ah, have I done? Okay, great. <laughs> this is the command that I want. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and go to the right directory before I run this. Um, 
So if I, um, so I cap, okay, so this is the file that I had before. I run this command. Yes. So it gives me back the, um, I'm not going to expect you to remember this command. It's not important. But the point is that uh, I can see what the, the systemd file is actually going to contain. So it contains the after start stuff, the description stuff, the exec start, kill mode, restart, whatever. And this is, um, so Nix stores everything in uh, its own kind of directory, which is essentially a, like a Git repo. It has like the, this hash that you just, not, not, not meant for humans. But uh, it does this one concession to usability, which is actually put the thing at the end that, it, um, that the hash is off. So anyway, uh, as you can see, that is the systemd unit file. Um, so I created another file, which is adapted. So there's a, there's a tool called NixOps, which is what I'm using here, um, that if you go to the manual for it, kind of uses this, um, it, it starts you off with this. So I've kind of adapted that. I made a few changes. But um, so the web server is the web server that I had before. I call it a web server. And I enable rollbacks, which I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm hoping to demonstrate in a bit. Um, so this is a virtual box deployment, just as a, because that's, the, that's, the, that's a trivial example that they give. And it's great, because it doesn't require me to actually hit the internet in case that was because that's you know glitchy or problematic or whatever. So this is a deploy. So this is just saying, hey, this I want a virtual box um, host that's this big uh, or whatever. And then I create a deployment. So I've created a deployment already, but I create the deployment and then I deploy it, and then it just gives me tons of art. But it won't this time because, like I said, it's referentially transparent. I did this before because I don't want it to take forever. Um, and then I check that it works. So I do that. So so this is a, so this is a tool. Um, so as you can see, it has one deployment. It should have one deployment in it. Great. Next ops, deploy. The dash D stands for deployment. So I could go to Nix ops deploy dash dash deployment trivial. But it'll do that. Oh, no, it couldn't connect. What's wrong? Oh, no. Oh, no. Um, not sure what's gone wrong. Uh, I'm just going to. Maybe I'm not running VirtualBox. I think I feel like that's it. Ah, that's why. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna start it. Just so. Anyway. Yeah. It's not running yet. Okay. Great. Started the SSH daemon. So this should work now. Fingers crossed. OK. Yep. So again, uh, in preparation for this live demo, I did this one before. And I um, didn't want you to kind of sit through like lots and lots of scrolling build output, which is something that Nix does a lot. Um, anyway, so oh yeah, so I've, I deployed it. And I actually have to confirm that it works. So it gives me the um, IP address here. Um, so I just, so 192.168.56.101. It's 56, right? 101. 3000. Uh, okay, so great. So I'm actually running this on VirtualBox. So this is as easy as defining, as running these commands and, um, okay. Um, Great, so what about this is functional? Again, like I said, it won't, uh, Nix tries very hard to avoid rebuilding things. Uh, it ca caches at the level of the build artifacts. So now that I've deployed my, deployed to this machine once and I haven't changed anything, a redeploy changes almost nothing. It's very fast. Uh, it's all declarative. So these are all files, right? There's nothing that's performing like IO or being like, hey, I want you to read this from. <laughs> Everything's like talking to other Nix files. Oh, what have I done? Yep, so it's functional. I argue that it's functional. So great, we have functional DevOps. We have functional deployments. We can all go home, right? I can hang up my pager. Nothing will ever go wrong. Everything is amazing forever, except, except that requirements change, as they always do. So I'm going to go back to this, uh, this app that I started with. Um, uh, yes, so there's an issue with this app. It's a pretty obvious issue, and you know what to look for it. But I'm just going to point it out. This is a problem. Who hard codes their port in their app? This is not good. This is quite frustrating. What happens if I want to run more than one copy of this app on the same machine? What happens if I want to run this app on a port other than 3000? What do I do? You know. And if you're a DevOps engineer in the sense of a big DevOps dev split like I am, what you do is you go back to your devs and go, hey, 
So that app, uh, you need to make a few changes to it. You need to, you, need to, you need to be able to, I need to be able to configure the port that it's running on. And if your devs are anything like our devs, you know, maybe this example is a bit contrived. What they'll say is, sorry, we're busy. You know, we're running, um, we're trying to write version two of the app, which is not only configurable, but allows you to do things other than output this string, or they're busy with other stuff. And this is a contrived example, but we do have like instances, uh, I have encountered instances where I say there's a memory leak in an application, and nobody knows what the memory leak is, and uh, you're trying to fix it, but in the meantime, you, you want to be able to fix it somehow on your end so that you're not paged at 3 a.m., which, which is frustrating for everyone. So requirements change. But fortunately, we have Nix. And Nix builds things in stages, and one of those stages is a patch, is a patch phase, or it calls them phases. And you can just patch the app. In this case, it's quite straightforward. We know what changes to make. So I've uh, you know, gone ahead and created, created a file that takes the old uh, lines and puts some new lines in there. And since this is all run in kind of in bash, I've gone ahead and uh, output the content so you can see that it's actually working. So we're going to do that. And um, yeah. So the only difference is that I do. Oh, see, here the problem is that I've, I've, I've been too clever for my own good and I've done this before on this machine. But fortunately, um, and this is, you know, this is an issue occasionally, but in, and fortunately, uh, Nix is not smart enough to know that um, just a white space change or something like that is, uh, is irrelevant. So I'm just going to go ahead and do that. Did a white space change, nothing's really changed in terms of like application. And you know, a successor to Nix ideally would know that, hey, you haven't actually changed anything meaningful. But Nix does not. So I'm going to go ahead and patch it. So you can see what the patched app looks like. Yeah, so as you can see, I've, my patch has been applied successfully. This is what the contents of it look like. So it builds. Um, so I have that. And um, I make my service with only minor changes. First of all, I need, um, instead of calling my, my, old, my, old, uh, config, uh, my old build configuration, I call a slightly newer one. And I want a new option. So I have a new option that gives me the port that I want to run on. And um, the default is 3,000, just in case I forget to specify it. But now I can just use um, any port that I want. And in addition to using any port, I have to enable that port, not just 3,000. So this is slightly different. And um, I actually pass my configuration in as a command line parameter. So there are other ways, there are other ways to pass it in. Ideally, you'd put, like in a, you'd put in a configuration file. Like if, you, if you really, really, really wanted to like go as far as um, patching, it just occurred to me earlier today that you could uh, configure it in here and then patch the, the application based on the value here. So you wouldn't actually have to do the patch that I did before. But um, I'm not, I wasn't quite that brave for this talk. So, the, um, so I import my patch service. And then I specify a slightly different port, just so you know that I'm not like, you know, pulling the wool over your eyes and only the old service is actually running. Uh, I deploy it again. So let's do that. Um, all right. So, so what I've done is that I've, um, this, is, this is kind of where I lost patience. Because you can see I have my, my, my thing in my, uh, um, my patch file. So then I only, uh, so I edited the web server um, file instead of creating like a different web server patch and creating a new deployment. OK, so I do that. So now things are actually going to be copied over at least. I don't think anything, actually, yeah, things might be, yeah, things won't be rebuilt as such, but they'll be copied over. And it's going to take a few more seconds. Yeah, OK, great. That was really fast. Nice. Thank you, NixOps. All right, so I actually have to confirm that this works. So I go. Two thousand one this time. Oh no, is it was it did I have the wrong um nope, that should have worked. Uh, oh yeah, sorry. Uh what I did is that I silly uh silly me, I forgot to give it a give it the different port. So it's still running on three thousand. So deploy again.
OK. Now I do my, yes, success. So can you see that? Oh, yeah, no, not really. Uh, try that again. Yes. So you see that working? Great. So I have my, my deploy. Great. So what if at this stage somehow, somehow I made a mistake that made it through Nix's uh, checks? Because Nix kind of does a check phase. It's one of its stages to check that what you're building is actually good, which is before it switches things over. So if I wanted to roll back, it's actually not that, not that hard. So uh, the fact that I specified my rollback, uh, I enabled rollbacks earlier, means that I can just roll back by running this command. So I do that. Uh, okay, great. Yeah, so um, so then I can just go with my old. Um, so it's on three thousand again. No, unless it's not. Uh, okay. This is a mistake that I made with my. So maybe what I really want to do is I want to switch to do. Yes. So this is just because of stuff that I did in prep for, for this demo. But uh, yeah, so as you can see, like rolling back is just as easy as running a command. It's very, very, very good. So in summary, what is Nix? Nix uh, is a package manager. It's a programming language. It's a build slash environment tool. It's a set of packages. It's a whole bunch of things. But for our purposes, it's a way for us to get um, declarative and functional package management. Nix OS uh, is an operating system built around Nix. So I completely forgot to mention this. But Nix OS is the, uh, is the operating system that's running on, um, on my VirtualBox host and any, any system that you expect to be able to declaratively configure using Nix. So it's Nix OS. So NixOps is the tool that I was, uh, was using. It's a cloud deployment tool. It's a configuration management tool. It completely like, gets rid of, so it means if you have NixOps, you don't need Puppet, you don't need Ansible, you don't need, um, you don't, you don't need many things, but you don't need any configuration management solution over and above what Nix itself provides. Because Nix, NixOS and NixOps work really, really well together. And DevOps with Nix, it's, it's automatic. It's just one command. It's repeatable. I can do this like, reliably on a whole bunch of machines, which is exactly, exactly what I do at work. It's item potent. If nothing's changed on the host, nothing, needs to be, nothing more needs to be done. It'll just be like, hey, I have nothing to do. It's reversible. You saw, you saw how easy it was for me to roll back and forth. It's atomic. If something is broken, it won't switch it over. It'll always be in a working state. It'll always either be in the old working state or the new working state, nothing else. And it's functional. It's declarative. It's referentially transparent. It's amazing. It's great. I'm just going to hold it there so I can take a photo of you. So does, if you so desire. Um, Thank you. Thank you for listening. That's all I have for you today. <laughs> Questions? Hi, yes. Uh, I think I think I understand. So how do I how do I how do I interoperate with uh, a package or something else that has been packaged for another distro? Yeah. So um, do I have to write a .nix for that? Um, in most cases, yes. It is probably less effort for you to um, to write a .nix file for the source than it would be for you to download the Debian file and try to figure out how to make that work in Nix. But it is doable. Nix does have facilities to kind of create essentially uh, like a like an environment, an opaque environment, like a like a truth that has other build tools available that will allow your package to pretend that it's running on Debian. So yes, it is possible to do, but it might be less effort to just write a not Nix file. Any more questions? Yes. At what uh, level do you start and stop with these dependencies? I, I think I saw there that you had libraries, right? So like the dynamic linker type libraries, are they hashed and then you link with those? or Right. How is that determined? Right. Um, so the, I think the question is how finely are de dependencies specified? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so. Or, or how automatic do you do the dependency right. determination? Um, so Nix um, builds on top of um, 
uh, uh, one giant Git repo called Nix Packages. It's not, not just a Git repo, but it's essentially a description of all the software in a, in a whole operating system, all the packages uh, that Nix knows how to build. So you can, um, so within that, within a single uh, revision of Nix packages, everything down to the level of GCC, uh, glibc, every library is specified. But that means that you don't actually have to specify anything yourself unless you want to override what has been overridden, uh, what has been specified for you by default. So Nix makes it really easy to override things. Uh, and uh, so if you say, hey, turns out I want to use a different version of GCC for this one uh, package, you can do that. I want to use a different glibc, easy. Uh, I want to patch things easy. So it makes it very, very easy to build, uh, override, manage software. It's basically, uh, it's very good at package management just because it gives you that level of control over your, all the software in your system. And uh, it binary caches very heavily. So one very nice thing about Nix is that um, the guys who run it, nixos.org, they have a binary cache, which means that they've built most of the packages that you want for you. So you don't have to build them from scratch. You can just pull them down from the binary cache. Yes, another question? Oh, yeah, back, back to you. The question was, do I uh, know of any progress on the type safe version of Nix? Um, there are people who are working on a type safe Nix, and I know that there are people who refuse to use Nix because it's not type safe, and it's not quite type safe, but I find that it's useful enough now that it's not really worth waiting until the magical like typed version of Nix happens. But there are people who are working on it, as far as I know. So, yes, back to you. Debian, for instance, has this problem right. wherein you need to do a libc upgrade, which is across the whole archive very, very hard to do, um, or any other uh, library. Um, here, in this case, I guess all you have to do is you, you keep installing other software. Yes, they yes. Provide their yeah. own, they pull in their own right. dependencies. Those can coexist. Yep. The, the question. Yeah. Sorry. So the question was, uh, how do you, how does this coexist with um, package upgrades of like really system libraries that other things, lots of things depend on? And one uh, one one feature of, is that is that the question? Part of the question. Okay. Uh, the, the other one, I guess, is uh, let's say in one of the libraries you find a security problem. Is it possible to say, give me all of the software that's linking to this particular right. hash line? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so, if one, okay. So, if I can repeat the question, one question is how does this uh, deal with like uh, library upgrades that lots of software depends on, and two, how is, how easy is it to patch a security patch um, um, uh, affected software? So, yes. So, um, like, um, so if you if you've done if you've looked closely into build tools, you'll find that one description of them can be uh, a dependency graph, so a, a, direct, a directed acyclic graph where you have uh, your dependencies on one end and your dependence on another. And um, yeah, I guess it's probably OK if I go there. No? Uh, yes. Um, and Nix makes it very, yes, Nix allows software that runs on, Nix depends on different versions of the library to coexist, because everything hashes, uh, everything is linked with, uh, with, the, with the hash of the library that it's linking to, uh, and which makes security also very easy. But Nix uh, is also maintains like a database of what packages link to other packages. So you can actually just go and say, hey, this library, what things d depend on it? And it'll give you an answer. And you can go ahead and uh, update everything that needs to be updated. So yes, but, and everything, yeah. It works, it works really well in practice. Um, this laptop runs Nix OS. So it's at least good enough. It's at least pres LCA presentation ready. Um, yeah. Cool. Any more? Yes. Um, question is, the question is, are there any um, pitfalls with hardware support? Well, yes, as, as uh, Fraser pointed out, uh, installation of NixOS is something that has not been uh, adequately documented. Um, but in, in general, it's, it's, it is just a Linux distro. In the, so, in the, in the, uh, so the idea is that and, uh, and the flexibility of Nix means that some driver combinations that would, might, uh, might otherwise be problematic, or some hardware combinations might, uh, that might otherwise be problematic um, seem OK. I haven't really run into any issues with any of the hardware that I've used it on. And they're like, everyone loves being able to go, hey, I took this Raspberry Pi and I put NixOS on it. And so there's lots of people kind of like try to push how far it can go. They're like, hey, I have this router, I put NixOS on it. And everyone's like, great, fantastic, as opposed to you know, everyone else is just like, oh, whatever. Uh, it's really cool. And um, oh, I forgot, Nix um, has really good support for um, Mac OS in the sense that Nix Ops and Nix OS are not, uh, don't run so well on, Ma on Mac OS. But Nix itself is, um, I don't think, I don't know if it's quite, quite the same level as Homebrew, but it's, in the same, it's on the same playing field. 
So it's really good even if you never want to use NixOS or NixOps or whatever, you can just use it as a package manager and it coexists with Homebrew. It doesn't kind of stomp over it. It's really nice. I feel like we're done. Hey, no one else has any questions that I can see? Okay, if that's all, then uh, we can head to afternoon tea uh, a little bit early, but please give a hand to Vipar for his presentation. Mm -hmm.